Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in this beautiful blue blue orb, blue marble, the globe that we live on. Uh, my name is Andrew Pedersen, and it's my pleasure today to welcome you to this insightful webinar. Now, before we dive into today's session and discussion with Matthew Warnken of uh, AgriProve, I really would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land uh, from which we are all tuning in to today. I am joining you from the land of the Camaragal people, from where the suburb of Camaray in North Sydney derives its name. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. About today, a bit of housekeeping. Now, today's webinar is in webinar mode, which means that while you'll be able to see and hear us, I hope, uh, we won't be able to see or hear you. However, we highly value your participation and insights during the course of the webinar. So towards the end of the session, there will be an opportunity for you to ask uh, questions, and these can be uh, submitted at any time during the webinar through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And I will moderate those questions, presenting them to our speakers in the final segment of our hour together. Now, in doing so, let's, um, let's put some context around the topic for conversation today. And to set that discussion, I want to draw uh, our collective attention to a key resource that actually sheds quite important light um, on the Australian perspective uh, of this issue. And that is the State of the Environment Report, which is available uh, through the link that you've just received through the chat function. Now, the environment, State of the Environment Report offers a very comprehensive overview of the current state of our nation's soils. This document does not only articulate our country's understanding in the management of soil health, but it actually serves, I think, as an important declaration of our country's communities, uh, civil society, business, academia, government, NGO, commitment to sustainable land management uh, to the international community. It's a testament to the notion uh, that sustainable land management is a, one of the significant underpinnings of our environmental, economic, and social well-being. Now, with that context in mind, it's my honor to introduce our esteemed speaker, who I'm going to be chatting with today, Mr. Matthew Wonkin. Matthew will now suddenly appear on the screen. Now, Matthew is a long way from the camera. So he's going to zoom in, I hope. Uh, Matthew is the Managing Director of AgriProve, which is an innovative company at the forefront of soil carbon solutions. AgriProve's mission is closely aligned with today's topic. In fact, it is the underpinning of today's topic, focusing on transform uh, transforming agricultural practices to not only benefit the environment, but, and here's a new one, to provide tangible benefits to farmers and the broader community and create a new form of value and wealth in our modern decarbonized nature positive society. Matthew brings a real wealth of knowledge. I've known him for a number of years and experience to our discussion. And I'm looking forward to a fascinating conversation about the challenges as well as the opportunities in soil health and the role of innovation in sustainable land management and the impact of those efforts on society at large. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Matthew to the webinar. Hello, Matthew Warnken. Hello, Andrew Peterson. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, thank you for that introduction. Great to be part of this webinar. I'm calling in from Gadigal country, the Aura Nation uh, this afternoon. Excellent, very good. Um, and for those of you who have the access to the chat function, more than happy for you to uh, include and show us, uh, let us know where you are coming from in relation to country. 
So let's start at the very beginning because it's a very good place to start. And if nobody knows what that cue is, then it does show my age. Um, Matthew, for those of us who might only remember biomes from school science classes, and in fact, when I remember you talking about this a while ago, I thought, is it bio me or bio any? Anyway? Um, give us a quick refresher um, of what exactly is a biome and why it's actually quite crucial to the effective operation of our planet. Sure. Um, so I think about biomes as the biological infrastructure of, of our planet. Uh, and then maybe to put that in, in, in context in terms of the state of the environment report, that state of the environment report is a snapshot in terms of the underlying biome in, in Australia. It's the habitat of everything living, plants and uh, animals. Uh, and it's really that, that snapshot it gives an insight to the quality of that infrastructure, the quality of the biome, which directly influences and impacts the quality of our civilization here in Australia, but also our global civilization. But that collection, all living things, uh, plant and animal, and it doesn't take much reading into a document like, say, the Environment Report to realize Australia in particular has got a lot of land uh, and not necessarily in, in great, uh, great, great condition. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's helpful. And we've referenced the state of the environment report, which uh, says exactly what you've just said. So you've often talked to me and to our members, because you are a member of our organization about the human biome. And that's kind of a bit um, head turning, as well as the soil biome. Okay. So we're talking about two different, but clearly interrelated biomes. Help us understand what though you've talked about soil. Let's talk about human Help us understand what that concept is in the context context of what you've just said, and then um, a really bad metaphor that I came up with with was: Do we think about the human biome as a bustling city, and the soil bi biome as a what? Star Trek United Federation of Planets. Thank you. Um, yes. <laughs> Thank you for that reference. It's good. Uh, let's come uh, full circle back, though, in terms of you know, that, that concept around biome, soil biome and human uh, uh, biome, uh, because that, that quality of the so soil uh, biome directly interacts with our human biome. And there are so many uh, parallels. Now, I, like most people, you know, starting to become aware of, of uh, human uh, gut health and the importance of gut health uh, to human health. Uh, the fun fact that you might not be aware of is only 4% of our gut flora grows on agar dishes. And 20 years ago, the science of the day was all agar dishes. So when uh, scientists were looking at the human biome or looking at our human digestion, looking as to uh, what was going on, they were looking through a very narrow window and seeing uh, not a lot. Uh, then uh, along comes the human biome uh, project run by the uh, National Health Institutes out of the States. And that was setting up to completely DNA sequence uh, our gut flora. Uh, and then it was like, oh, my God, the lights were on. We could see everything clearly. And in fact, it was so profound. I think it's, it kind of answers the question as to whether there's aliens. We don't no longer need to ask, is there alien life? The aliens have been, they've colonized the planet. And this brain is to keep our alien overlords and masters uh, safe. And, and so we don't bump into uh, any sharp, sharp obje objects. But that was the level of transformation in understanding just that huge complexity of our microbiome and how important that is to human health, to, to, to mental health, uh, to, to everything. Now, the parallels then to, uh, to soil, to understanding, looking at soil measurement and soil biome. So in conventional agriculture, we're only really sampling or looking at the top four inches of soil. So looking through a very narrow window and in terms of like understanding in terms of that, that, that complexity of life that, that's going on, it's only recently alongside our understandings of the, the human biome and, and the importance of that microbial population there, that we've started to get a renewed understanding of the importance of soil uh, biome and biodiversity. Now, the fun fact for today is that with the new research and understanding into the soil biome, we now understand that 60% of all terrestrial life and biodiversity is below the surface. So the soil biome, the soil, is home for 60% of all life 
uh, on the planet. Uh, and then you start to unpack too that importance of microbial populations of uh, beneficial uh, fungi of those, those insect you know, communities and soil, that soil biome is fundamental to pretty much every ecological process on, on, on the planet. Uh, climate regulation, clean water, nutrient density uh, in, in foods, grow, uh, uh, growing food, uh, the list uh, goes on uh, and on. And it, it is, is, is such a, a profound connection that I think conceptually we need to start you know, moving away from uh, thinking about say paddock to plate uh, and start thinking about biome to biome because it's the quality of that biome which affects quality of food and there's a direct interaction. So when we're actually consuming food, uh, in a way, we're consuming the biome from, from where, where, where that, uh, that, uh, that food is produced. Okay, so that, that comes to a beautiful segue to the importance of soil. And as you just said, it, it, it underpins the ability of food to be able to be grown for the purpose of it going from a soil biome, arguably into a human biome. And so the thing that's interesting about that is, and if you sort of start pondering it, um, why should we really care about the issue of soil, especially if we're not involved in farming or environmental science? What, really, why do we care about what's really happening um, beneath our feet because surely it's been there forever it has um, it has incredible um, uh, scientific as well as cultural importance and you know calling out through the um, acknowledgement of country let us not forget that our our original soil scientists of 65,000 years have been maintaining it but why should we really care about it if we're not involved in the issue of soil science on a daily basis yeah um so thinking through that, that, that question, Andrew, really points to the, just that foundational fundamental aspect of soil. Uh, and anyone in the webinar who's involved in anything to do with soil understands this, you start to unpack uh, you know, composition soil, functioning of biologically healthy soils, uh, how that influences our, our whole ecology. You realize that soil is fundamental to our global civilization, to a safe climate, uh, it's actually the underpinnings of our global economy. And we, you know, in, in a way, we, we haven't been aware of it. Why? Because it's un underneath our, our feet. But the opportunity uh, uh, for innovation is to start taking the lessons that we can learn from that underlying uh, ecology, from the underlying soil biome, and to start to influence how we reshape and rethink about sustainable business. Uh, so businesses that are in line with the ecology of the planet. And for that, we need new business products. We need new services. We need new uh, business models. And the operating system of that underlying soil ecology uh, and the importance of that you know, is great guidance from an innovation perspective. Uh, but to then maybe bring it back to why should we worry about soil? So, soil, not only the largest biodiversity treasure trove, uh, also the largest terrestrial sink of carbon uh, on, 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 on the planet. Now, why that matters is because, in a way, our conventional agricultural systems, in terms of how we feed a global population, uh, there's a lot of things that aren't necessarily beneficial to soil. We can grow food, sure, but it comes at a cost to those microbial uh, communities. Uh, a couple, couple of examples, um, adding synthetic nitrogen to soil increases the acidity of soil, makes it hard for flourishing microbial uh, communities. Um, uh, pesticides, adding pesticides, you know, in terms of controlling systems, again, makes it hard for flourishing microbial um, um, populations. The emerging soil science is that it is microbial necromass or dead bugs, and that makes up the bulk of soil organic carbon. So if we wanna harness soil as a carbon removal technology, we really need to examine and lead into how can we redesign our food systems, our agricultural, how we do agriculture in, in a way that builds healthy soil biome in a way that builds soil, soil carbon. Now, the importance of that is the scale at which this can operate. So uh, another fun fact, if you were to take the prime agricultural land in Australia, so that's grazing uh, and cropping, 
So we're not talking about range land. So we're sort of getting out into sort of, uh, you know, Western New South Wales, Western Queensland, et cetera. Yeah, th th these are uh, where we are doing row crops, where we're doing grazing. If we were to increase the soil organic carbon content in the top 30 centimetres by just, just one percentage point, that would give us 10 billion tonnes, 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide removes. So that would remove all the legacy emissions from Australia from pretty much the last 20 years. And I actually believe that you could do four times that over. You could actually completely remove all fossil legacy emissions, uh, taking that carbon out of the atmosphere where it's a problem, putting it into soils where it's a fundamental resource. Now, the pathway to that is an innovation challenge. Um, but certainly the team at AgriProof, in terms of going out, sampling soils, looking at how management plays an, uh, a, a massive role in improving soil quality and building soil carbon, we have absolutely that building evidence base that, you know, not only can it done, but it's imperative to be done because I certainly mm. can't envisage any version of a safe climate where every hectare of land isn't managed for drawdown, every hectare of land isn't managed for soil conservation, and every hectare of land isn't managed for biodiversity and nature repair. Okay, so let's um, let's unpick that a little bit and, and start looking at the very thing of challenge around how we manage this particular um, opportunity in a decarbonised, nature-positive world. You, you've spoken about the notion of the innovation challenge, and I'd like you to speak a little more about what that looks like in this current um, day and age, particularly around soil management, because it's it's something that we all think from, I guess, from a mother's milk point of view is absolutely right. And of course, we we do care for the soil or we have somebody care for the soil for us, but it, we're not thinking about it as a natural asset that needs to be not just managed well, but actually harnessed for future value. So um, with that, what's the biggest hurdle here? I mean, can you give us some sort of size and compare it to either a giant ma uh, maze or a puzzle? And and if there is identification around what the dollar size of managing soil is going to look like, then that'd be interesting as well. Sure. Um, yeah. So how to, how to conceptualize challenges in the form of a, a giant puzzle. Um, uh, so uh, maybe it's finding those corner pieces as to where to begin to build up confidence in terms of, aha, now we know what we need to, to uh, fill, fill, uh, fill on. So let me try to build on that. So if you had corner pieces on a giant puzzle, there's four corner pieces that we need to solve for. Uh, the first innovation challenge is measurement. How do you measure soil carbon? It's a biological system. Nature's not linear. Uh, there's a lot of, of fluctuation, uh, but there's also a raft of emerging technology that is helping us digitize soil carbon pro uh, properties. Better measurement uh, with in, uh, satellite models, but coming back to that concept around if you can digitize soil carbon properties, and we've been working with a great Australian company, Own Carbon, in terms of getting near infrared spectroscopy to give us a digital fingerprint of soil. Why that becomes important is because we're making soil indexable. We're indexing soil properties so you can actually search it uh, and you can then start to understand in terms of those management pract uh, practices on soil, the changing landscape functions, just what has changed and what is important in terms of driving those change. So those necessary conditions, those necessary factors. So soil, soil measurement is a challenge. Australia is actually leading the world uh, in, in, in uh, soil carbon uh, measurement. There was a great program, the Soil Carbon Innovation Challenge, which is providing a big boost to how you develop even better uh, models to augment ground truthing and, and, and digitizing soil properties. That'd be one corner of the puzzle. Hmm. Uh, but measurement's great, but if you can't actually tilt the dial in terms of management having an impact, uh, then all we are able to do is to sort of look at how, <laughs> with greater and greater levels of accuracy and precision, how we're sort of, you know, uh, controlled flight into terrain and sort of bollocksing everything up. So we need those management insights into what's working. And here in the, in the, in the soil space, that debate, uh, you know, it's often been said that the biggest factor controlling uh, soil carbon is rainfall. 
Uh, and certainly you need rain, you need water to be able to grow things, to be able to have those, those healthy, uh, uh, healthy soils. Uh, soils. Um, but you also need a whole raft of other factors such as sunlight. You know, so we need that raging ball of energy that uh, needs to be uh, continuously operating with photosynthesis to actually turn uh, that solar energy into carbohydrate sugars to help plants grow. Now that's useful insight, same insight as, oh, you need rain to build, build soil carbon, but we don't have control over the sun. We do not have control over rainfall. We absolutely have control over management practices. Mm. And there are a raft of management practices which we know compact soil. Now, the trouble with compaction is when the rain falls, it doesn't go in, 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 into the actual soil profile. So your effective rainfall could be far less than the actual rain that's falling on a given mm. paddock. Mm. And that is 100% management driven. So, but those challenges are how do we linking management to what's measured in terms of those improved practices and landscape uh, outcomes? Let me pause there before I go into those other two, two edges of the puzzle. Okay. Um, so with that, the, the other two, are they elements that um, from, from making the puzzle um, what? more interconnected and particularly from the perspective of the challenge that we have at the moment, are they a function of technology? Are they a function of better data? Are they a function of all of the above plus a greater appreciation within civil society, particularly around the value of soils to deliver not just food, but a, a decarbonised world? Because we don't hear a lot of discussion in the Australian um, circumstance around the decarbonisation of our energy system and talk and immediately think of soil. We think of renewables, um, solar, wind, increasingly energy efficiency, but soils don't immediately come to mind. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that, uh, Andrew. Soils don't immediately come 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 to mind. Uh, I think there is a great parallel uh, with, with energy, just as a quick, quick aside, great parallel with uh, energy and a lot we can learn in terms of the strategic direction of soil carbon in particular, but broader, like how do we uh, regenerate our food systems? And I'm, I'm a big fan of the collective noun, uh, regenerative agriculture. Uh, the reason I'm a big fan of it is it locates that challenge for innovation and also the strategic imperative, uh, as I believe regenerative is to agriculture, what renewables has been to energy. We're probably mm. just about 20 years uh, behind. Hopefully we can catch up in terms of that ramp up uh, uh, ramp up the curve, uh, but a lot of parallels. And, and you mentioned in terms of that value proposition. Uh, so I think there is a lot about values. And so it's not front of mind in terms of safe climate, the importance of soil. So that third corner uh, is another M, it's monetizing. So we actually need that marketplace to incentivize better management practices. And this is the Australian Carbon Credit Unit Scheme because uh, carbon credits are actually an incentive to do better uh, for, for, for Matthew, we've lost your um, audio. So if you can... We need those incentives. We are a market-based economy. A business by its DNA understands not reporting, but revenue generation. Mm. And I think another aside, if we want to have a debate around pricing on carbon and economic efficiency, uh, no economist that I'm aware of, or hardly any other economist has ever had to do a startup and create a funding model to drive this innovation, to drive this change. Carbon credits are a funding model where we can actually measure and quantify outcomes and then provide incentives for landholders to participate and to get on and, and to, to monetize that, that, that improved stewardship, which is now moved away from a qualitative basis. So if you contrast, say, the previous sort of 20 years of engagement with nature uh, repair, there's been a lot of grant works. Now, grants are great, uh, but they're pretty much qualitative. Carbon, on the other hand, is quantitative, and that data-driven insights is what we really need to unlock at scale uh, transformative management and practice change. 
Uh, but we don't get that unless we get those carbon offset ad incentives uh, to do better. So yeah, people ask them what they can do. Make sure you always tick the box. <laughs> always, <laughs> always support the market that you're looking uh, you know, to drive tran transformation. So um, we, I, we hear, can I interrupt? Because we hear, I just want to pick up on something you've said, which is about this notion of scale. Um, in terms of size, what are we needing as the input um, to being to being able to use soil as this, you know, the 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 sink, um, pun intended, and and not pun intended, um, going forward? Because there's there's a lot out there, and and let, let's be let me be the agent provocateur for just one moment about the notion that Australia's soils is highly degraded, and this is exactly what the State of the Environment report says, and so. The concerns about the additions, not additionality, but the additions to the soil to make it more um, valuable from one perspective is kind of a self-defeating exercise. You're going to have to put too much into it to be able to achieve the, the output that um, a lot talk about soil being this, this um, a sink opportunity. Help us understand what, what that's about and where that fallacy is needing to be overcome. And then the, the point that you say about scale, what, you know, tonnage, what are we talking about in terms of creating that kind of scale necessary for it to contribute to decarbonisation? Yeah, um, no, really valid points to, to bring up, uh, Andrew. And and we, we, we do hear that a lot in terms of, oh, you know, uh, if, even if you could measure it, you know, the the capacity for Australian soils to store carbon is just not there. And I think it's a, uh, so in terms of if we're looking at gaps, what barriers or what gaps do we need to bridge? It's the data-driven insights, that evidence base uh, that supports biological pathways to productivity uh, as opposed to inputs or controlling pathways to productivity. Now, to illustrate this, to let me, let me, let me take you on a, a poetic discovery of the beauty and splendor that is earthworms. Uh, so consider the Hudmal earthworm. In a healthy soil, in a shovel full of that soil, you will get at least 10 earthworms uh, per, per, per shovel full. Now, why that matters is because of the cumulative benefit that you get from earthworms. Uh, so in terms of a mass basis, what that translates to over a full hectare is something like two and a half tons of earthworm activity in that top 30 centimeters layers. Now that's more than what most farms would carry in terms of livestock. So your underground herd of earthworms actually weighs more, has got more mass than the above ground herd. It's also providing far more ecological services uh, than uh, arguably, uh, uh, all of the inputs that you could put put into it. So earthworms turn over at least half their weight uh, in terms of soil. So that that uh, herd of earthworms on a per hectare basis actually has the potential to create one and a half centimetres across the whole hectare of worm cast. Uh, in a way, we're making soil biologically in real time as opposed to contrasting to previous conceptual models was all geological, uh, all geologically based. So that biological pathway to better healthy soils actually starts to create a year on year benefit where you're depositing effectively one and a half centimeters of topsoil uh, across the, the, uh, the whole farm each and every year. Now, then that also goes on to set up a virtuous cycle in, from a whole raft of other uh, uh, aspects. Now, part of the life of an earthworm, which you know, kind of makes sense when you say it, but isn't necessarily readily apparent, is that earthworms need oxygen to live. They need to breathe. Uh, so you actually need a, uh, a highly uh, porous soil structure for earthworms to flourish. But what that means is you've actually got high gaseous exchange with the atmosphere. Another fun fact, above every square meter of land in terms of mass, there is eight tons of nitrogen above it. You think like, well, we're not going to get to the whole top of that stack in terms of gas exchange. We're probably not. But if you consider a, another hectare, the top metre above the ground, around about 10 tonnes of nitrogen in math. Uh, again, we, we don't see it, so we're not really thinking about it. But that nitrogen combined with 
aerated soil structure and microbial activity points to nitrogen fixing. So now we can start to fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere. We can start to make topsoil through biological pathways. Now, both of those activities can be brought about by improved management practices and improving how you manage your above ground herd in, in cattle, but they don't rely on any additional inputs, but radically transform the soil biome. So again, it's this focus on how do we get pumping biologically active soils because then that is a pathway to building large volumes of soil organic carbon, remembering emerging science, it's dead bugs that you know, go into that, that, that soil organic uh, carbon pool, um, plus creating topsoil, uh, plus creating better infiltration uh, pathways of rain, uh, that means, uh, and better holding capacity too of that, uh, that, that uh, rainfall, uh, which drives straight into resilience, so that's hanging on longer before going into drought, coming out sooner, going into drought, far more living root. It's uh, living roots and living mass. It is a completely different process of running agriculture. And what we are unpacking is the evidence base to support that and to make that bankable. Uh, Australia is supported by some enormously talented innovators, intuitive farmers who read landscapes, doing incredible stuff in terms of biological system. Uh, just the one sort of unfortunate fact, uh, which actually is not just due to Australia, not just peculiar to Australian innovators, but worldwide, these leaders in regenerative practices seem to have the one common trait in common, which is that they're crap at record keeping. And when you think about the peer reviewed science, that's record keeping on steroids. And when you think about carbon credits, that's record keeping. When you think about funding models for these new approaches to regenerative agriculture, Funding, uh, 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 financing is all record keeping. And this is the bridge that we can start to bring in in terms of building up the evidence base. So every soil carbon project is essentially a living lab in applied science. Where we're able to get better and better insights as to what's happening below the, the, uh, the surface. Uh, it is a, a building up that evidence in terms of impacts of management on affecting outcomes from, from landscape and building up more funding models to fundamentally change how uh, agriculture can be implemented and operationalized. Okay. All right. Well, we, we have a, a, a little bit of a logistic issue in that we can't see you um, at some point because um, you're operating your audio separate from your video, but we'll, we'll attempt to overcome that. But it's the pearls of wisdom rather than the visage that's far more important to be hearing rather than seeing at the moment. Um, that explanation is incredibly comprehensive and a little bit daunting, I'd have to say, in, in a world in which um, the solutions to these challenges are ever more trying to be as simple and as shovel-ready, pun intended, uh, as humanly possible. Um, we get to the point, though, that business is responding to this, and you made a very interesting comment about farmers, which we won't repeat again. Um, but the observation that they are, in one sense, the superstars, along with, there we go, now we can see you, except you're turning. That's an interesting way of looking at you. Excellent. All right. So I know how then we can then fix that up ever so slightly. All right, very good. Um, what, role, uh, what role do farmers play in this? Because historically they have been there to create value from growing and grazing. This yep. is kind of a different model and it, it requires real transformational mindset rethink for not just governments and players in this sector, including the finance sector and others, to want to be able to involve themselves in it, but the farmers themselves have to be, in one sense, the curators and the guardians of the mass operation that is going on very much beneath their feet. What's your observation so far, because you deal with farmers on a regular basis, what's your observation so far around what their challenges and what they're excited by and what they need to be uh, capable of doing into the future to deliver what you see is the vision for soil um, in a decarbonised world. Sure, and, and that's a great way of bringing back to that fourth 
uh, puzzle piece in terms of that last corner, uh, which is all about enabling participation. Because without participation, we can have the best measurement systems in the world, the best management you know, regimes of innovative practices to implement, even the best monetizing uh, uh, aspects. But if we do not have farmer engagement, farmer involvement, uh, then we don't achieve uh, any, any outcome. Uh, and so for us at uh, AgriProof, we, we see our role in, in sort of enabling participation as a key mitigator of risk. So we want to remove risk from participating in these emerging markets, these ecosystem services markets, and facilitate uh, uh, that, that, that participation. But participation is key. And in fact, when you want to look at the overall integrity of a, uh, a, a scheme, a program like the Australian Carbon Credit Unit Scheme, that's one of the key metrics that we need to be tracking, participation. Because if we don't have participation, if we don't reward and celebrate those landholders, those producers, those growers who put up their hand and say, I want to learn by doing, I want to be part of a solution, I want to be incentivized and, and have my contributions actually uh, recognized, validated and, and rewarded, then we get, get nowhere. And I think this is like a, a personal bugbear of mine is that we do not celebrate the achievements that Australia has, has already forged mm in terms of nature-based solutions. Mm. Almost 10% of Australia's land mass is currently in a nature-based solutions carbon credit related uh, 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 program, mm -hmm. project. That is the highest by participation rate per capita and the highest area of land worldwide in terms of participation. And I think this gets missed out uh, in, that, in that debate around, oh, okay, are we measuring enough or uh, you, know, uh, you know, what's the integrity? Um, you know, what are the standards? Uh, is this addition, uh, additional? Because you miss that fundamental piece that we need to go as quickly as possible to full participation so that we can support, uh, you know, those, those landowners, those producers and growers to be incentivized to ch uh, ch ch changing their practices. Now, what we hear is the integration in terms of delivering carbon, uh, delivering ecosystem services, plus delivering food and fiber. Agriculture, I believe, is the only sector where you can do both. And this is what we love about the proposition, the underlying value proposition of soils, which we believe we will carry, carry through. It's not a debate about taking land out of production. Mm -hmm. It's a debate around how do we enhance uh, uh, that, uh, that, that production. So how do we do both? Food and fiber plus those uh, eco ecosystem uh, services. So what we're hearing and, and is that, that whole positive response to a concept of doing better. Uh, and last week, we were, uh, uh, the Agri-Proof team and I were out in Perth at Evoke Ag, and we launched a new initiative, which is all around that concept of doing better in terms of better grazing management. Um, we launched Ag's for Tons program, alongside another innovative, great Australian company, Sarah's Tag, uh, their CEO, David Smith, and myself were there to launch this, uh, uh, a new uh, availability of tech. The Sarah's Tag is a satellite-enabled uh, GPS smart tag, so think bit, bit per cow, uh, that allows you to get insights on the amount of pasture that's being eaten and the movement of, of, of cattle in grazing systems. Uh, now, what we bring to that is a novel piece of software, we as AgriProof, novel piece of software, uh, plus a funding mechanism to access that technology. Plus, we are there as the partner alongside those producers because we are incentivized to help make this technology. Oh, we've lost your audio. Thank you. Uh, there you go. Uh, some, some handy hints in terms of what we do. <laughs> Uh, next time. Anyway, anyway, hopefully audio back. But the insights here are profound for grazing management. Um, mm -hmm. A quick question for you, Andrew. What was the first sports team in the world to GPS track their players? Sports team to track their players. Yeah. So now we know that all sports teams uh, 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 essentially have GPS trackers to get individual player insights as to how to get the management science to get the best performance out of the team. It's um, a hard one to answer because it was the Brisbane Broncos. Oh. 
in early 2000s in a collaboration with Queensland University of Technology, an Australian innovation that has completely re revolutionized sports science. Now, I firmly have the opinion that if we revolutionize sports science by GPS tracking players, we will uh, revolutionize grazing management by tracking individual cows to get insights in terms of how to optimize them from an ecological perspective, uh, but also from a production perspective. Because if you think about it, every plant that a cow eats that doesn't re result in live weight gain, it's a wasted production you know, sort of opportunity. It's also a wasted ecological opportunity because that plant could have grown, could have got more you know, plant uh, leaf uh, mm -hmm. area, could have photosynthesized a bit more, got roots a bit deeper, fed a few more uh, microbes to you know basically feed the underground mm -hmm. uh, underground herd. So it's this convergence. Uh, uh, we're not sacrificing production. This is a, be a better way of doing production with those data insights. It's a far more sophisticated way. And super exciting to have done that complete worldwide search of available tech and then land up in, in Brisbane uh, with the David and, and, and the Sarah's tag uh, teams. So this is where we start to develop a level of excitement in terms of, yes, we're not sacrificing production. We're looking at enhancing production. And these are sophisticated tools. This is a sophisticated way of digitizing that practice to get algorithm insights as to how do we optimize our grazing program, how do we optimize our breeding program? How do we decommoditize beef? Because now we've got all that infrastructure for our consumers to go all the way back, not only to the paddock, but underneath it and, and, and start to enable that voting with your dollars in terms of those systems of, of production that are in tune with the ecology of the planet. Okay, so apart from the fact that I'd be fascinated to know how you deal with the privacy issues in relation to cow tracking and the um, cows themselves <laughs> signing over their IP in relation to what they do so that you can use it. Um, let's get into our hot exactly. category at well, this point. Uh, okay. Go on. Uh, I go straight to Gar Gary Larson. You know those Gary Larson cartoons? Yeah. Like the cows. So what happens when the, the humans bugger off, the cows go behind the barn? Sit around and smoking and chatting. That, yeah. that kind of stuff. He, That's knew, he knew before we all did. Uh, let's get the helicopter and, and now um, survey the landscape about the future. And in that, what is what is the, the role and the opportunity for business, not necessarily in the sector, because they seem to be fairly sophisticated from what you're telling us around um, the innovation that's undertaking. But what are those other elements of other parts of the business apparatus that can be involved. Clearly, finance is one of those, but you've also got technology that is becoming increasingly ubiquitous in this area, not just from things like drone or hard technologies of drones, but now the use of generative AI much must be able to then support taking this data and providing almost real-time insights back into farm operations. What is the what is the landscape of the opportunity for business here? Yeah, it's, well, it's a broad landscape, Andrew, because you again, come back to that earlier comment I made that we're going to turn, this has the potential to turn every farm into an applied science laboratory. Carbon, animal health, production, water, ecosystem services. Um, it also starts to redefine agriculture in terms of the workforce of agriculture and create a whole raft of new opportunities for participation. So it's not just, you know, previously big tractors, you know, big machinery, you know, it becomes far more nuanced. If you look at the way the technology is driving, smaller customized curated systems of production will become, uh, you know, not, not, not only uh, theoretically uh, plausible, but, but actually commercially available. So that's going to open up a whole raft of, re I believe, revitalization of rural and regional economies through those new uh, uh, funding models, so more funding, through those new job uh, requirements, so better tech, better data, better information, better curation. Uh, and then also the supply chain in terms of, okay, how do we connect the food supply system more direct to customer, uh, mm. direct, direct to consumer? And so that enabling a tech platform, you know, means, you know, I believe, in not too distant future, there's no reason why you, Andrew Peterson, couldn't have two acres of permaculture, you know, being autonomously managed and being you know, delivered through a whole raft of electric or, or auto uh, deliveries 
uh, straight 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 to your door. Um, which you know, if you start to think then about how that can potentially transform uh, our our rural and regional economies, our, our mm. rural and regional landscapes, I mean that becomes uh, uh, like phenomenal. It's, uh, it's certainly uh, personally uh, intriguing uh, to me in terms of just how quickly this change can go about. Um, and moving away from that almost normative, we need to do this uh, from a, a environmental perspective, but because this just becomes better, more opportunities, greater participation in that food supply chain, more direct invol involvement, more drivers for innovation and, and use cases. And then ultimately, I believe that takes us to space. Because when you think about it, if 60% of all life is in the soil biome, when we go to space, we need to be thinking, how do we take that Earth's biome with us? Ah. I don't think it will be enough to be relying on, say, hydroponic uh, you know, systems because yeah. uh, we will suffer as a species in terms of not having that, that connection with the, the soil biome uh, because we need that, that greater transformative capacity. And then when you think about terraforming in space, it really needs to be, we need to bring the biome with us. We need to understand how we can transplant <laughs> a soil bio. Uh, a nice segue there too, we could talk about transplanting human uh, biomes, but that gets yeah. a bit too graphic. <laughs> <laughs> but how do we do interplanetary transplants? Now, why I think that is fascinating is because that's a use case as we need to understand more and around our existing planet. And so it's almost like terraforming going to space starts with the curation and the care for our existing soil biome, which is beneath our feet. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's, it is, as I said, once you start to unlock everything about soil, it's hard not to get completely uh, consumed about it. So I'd be saying, let's mount a campaign. We need a ministry of soil, you know, in terms of it's because it's so foundational to everything. And then plus, if being able to harness that innovation, the, the potential for, for commercial advantages and putting, you know, the sort of the, the wealth. Uh, and growth of Australia's economy is also equally as, uh, as profound. Well, we did have a Ministry of Sound many years ago. So we now they were a band. That was a collective. I know, I know, I know, I know. But, you know, th this, this is beautiful music going forward, particularly in, although in the case of space, nobody can hear you play. So that's a big challenge. <laughs> um, and then we've got the other, uh, I guess, baby step issue that, you know, things that we send it, out into the world seem to fall over when they land. So we've, we've still got a couple of challenges to deal with there. Um, sure. In a quick wrap up, and we do have a couple of questions, so we will get to those um, very shortly. But um, uh, let's get back down on Earth from our helicopter and ask the, this very simple question. So what do I do right now as someone in, who is in business that wants to play in this space? Or... I want to take a purposive role as a consumer or I want to be uh, a responsible member of the Australian community and see that this is one of the important elements, the buckshot, as we were talking about only the other day, in our um, efforts as an Australian, uh, responsible Australian community towards decarbonisation. And when you think about it, that that kind of producer consumer community can all be wrapped up in one person. It doesn't have to be separate and, and pillared like individuals, which uh, I think is a lot of thinking that goes on in this space. So what does what does that individual who's listening in right now say, ah, Matthew's encouraged me to go and think about and talk to him about this. What would that be? Yep. Um, so uh, as a, a capitalist myself, uh, I, I love the concept of intentional consumerism. So voting with your dollars and you can't go past any opportunities to buy at grower markets. So to get more involved in terms of purchasing direct from growers, because that's a vote for a marketplace. So the more direct to consumer spend there is, the more that is amplified into a growing segment of the market, then the more solutions start to come into feeding that space. So that you know, where, where there are opportunities, uh, and we are fortunate, we've got some great grow, grower markets and we are fortunate to, as a society in Australia, to have that choice. We're not confronted with the choice of, can we eat or can't we eat? It's what do we choose to uh, eat? So, so using that power of choice, that power of spend uh, to consume locally. Um, if you then move on to the, you know, your, uh, uh, in, in that small business sector, uh, you're looking for business opportunities. There are huge opportunities everywhere in the carbon uh, economy. 
uh, and then decarbonizing, uh, but in particular in soil carbon, in particular in regenerative agriculture. So there are a wealth of opportunities that are emerging in terms of new niches, new service uh, you know, provision uh, uh, opportunities, everything from you know, G GIS spatial layers to uh, uh, altering different products into management, uh, you know, from reef credits, soil organic nitrogen biodiversity. Mm -hmm. There is So there's an emerging ecosystem of, of, of opportunities there. Um, the, the third point, uh, the question you asked was kind of intriguing too in terms of, because uh, I think a lot of people listening to this webinar are obviously interested, but also have a, a, a professional you know, sphere in which they can start to, to influence. And then you kind of start to think about, okay, well, what impact can we have as professionals to start to amplify, start to shift it? And I would love for sustainability reporting to remove away from micro dids and did nots, start to track other metrics such as what are we doing differently? What are we supporting for innovation? What is participation rate rates? I mean, like, I think one of the takeaways I'm going to take on uh, listening to myself talk here is just like, how can we start to track participation better in terms of nature-based projects mm. in Australia? Because that is not front and center and we should have goals because mm. again, I'm happy to have the debate as to how we can have a safe climate without widespread participation because I can't see it happening. That mm. strategic imperative is every hectare of land, drawdown, conservation, nature repair. So what should be those targets of participation and actually start tracking and setting some national targets? We had national targets for renewable energy in terms of that tracker. You know, you, you're a vintage now. You can probably remember the 2% target. Um, but that 2% target was enough to start tracking, was enough to start creating funding models yeah. to get things going. And now like the, the only way is like you know, fully deployed 100% re uh, 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 renewables. What can we do with land management in terms of similar metrics that we start to report on? And how do we start to lean into this concept too that actually climate is an innovation challenge? If mm. climate... Is a, is a symptom of a economy out of sync with the ecology of the planet. Mm. So we need to be doing new things. We're not gonna solve this by doing the same thing to slightly different. We need those new innovative practices. Well, if we're talking about reporting on sustainability metrics, where are those reports coming through? And how do we as professionals start to shift and shape what the focus is on and put things in a different lens that will actually lead to real world change, uh, uh, especially in the land area, especially in agriculture. Mm. Very comprehensive. As always, I love As talking always. to you. <laughs> let's have go for another have, hour. <laughs> have a mind that goes like this, starting. Well, let's let's do this just for a moment, which is um, answer a couple of the questions. Um, we have a question here from the audience, which asks, and it's a great question, how does, how does fire affect the soil biome? Yep. Um, so fire has an impact. Uh, and um, or I was going to say from a data perspective, I'd say they're fortunate, but then I realized it's actually unfortunately we have had uh, farms that we've been partnering with which have experienced fire. Um, but what we've seen is just that regenerative capacity of you know, soil is that, you know, those, you know, there's an inherent resilience in uh, uh, like a healthy soil in terms of coming back. So fire has an impact. What we're seeing is it doesn't burn out, say, all of those soil carbon uh, you know, gains. Um, and you know, in, in, you know, there's this recurring thematic of resilience in terms of you know, being able to recover more quickly from those, the, 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 those uh, disruptive events. Oh, okay. That's interesting. And so how... Just let's just pick up on that one. How then does a country, particularly Australia, with its um, its bushfires, how does it build an interface between the great work that you're doing and the work of the farmers in particular, and the challenge that we have in relation to disaster disasters and the resilience and the adaptation need? Is that is that both? I mean, it's a profound challenge, obviously, but are there insights in relation to how you deal with both going forward by using the work that you're doing, in fact, as an adaptation and resilience strategy? Um, 
huge challenge to throw in right at the very end. Yeah, I know. Uh, but but, <laughs> you know. So, but maybe, so, but probably no, maybe. We never this, sweat the small stuff, Matt. No, that's right. Um, but probably the, the insight that I would offer is, and, and something that we're leaning into at, at AgriProof, comes around to that evidence. And then how can we reach out to share more of those learnings uh, from, from projects? So we can actually build up uh, that applied science in terms of more uh, uh, farms, more areas being uh, under management, under measurement, to be mm -hmm. able to then understand uh, those, 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 relative, uh, those relative impacts and then to build up more of a, a resilient strategy around it. Um, I rely heavily on necessary condition analysis. Right? So that is, what are those necessary conditions that we need in order to build you know, soil? Mm -hmm. What are those necessary conditions grazing uh, management in pasture-based uh, systems? But I think too, there's, that's, that's a useful way of unpacking in terms of, okay, well, what are those necessary conditions we need for resilient agricultural systems in light of those uh, natural disasters, which under a changing climate are predicted to occur with far more increasing frequency. Uh, and so that is a longer piece of work, but to unpack that longer piece of work, it's necessary that we have large um, longitudinal studies of land that's being managed for biological pathways, having those insights in terms of what's being measured, we have to then contrast them in terms of the, 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 those impacts. Uh, so that is a longer term challenge, but again, coming back, there's no way you can unpack that challenge unless we have multiple you know, data sorts, multiple points of reference that we can actually then look at the, you know, those, those impacts and look at alternate, uh, alternate strategies. So one thing I can say with confidence is in order to unpack that, we need to move more to you know, that full take up of, of management, of, of me measurement throughout all agriculture uh, to be able to have that evidence base, to be able to you know, help tune uh, the underlying soil biome to best mitigate against those future disasters. Mm. Okay. So unfortunately, we are about to run out of time. So I want to leave you with the last scripted question that we have, but it's a, it's a really good one because it's come to that point of the discussion that it has to be asked. And that is, what do I do? What do I do next? You've had a really engaged audience and they've all hung around, which is very, very pleasing to see. But what do I do after I shut down from the webinar and I start thinking and pondering, need to talk to Matthew about what the opportunities are? What's the first, first, first three, first one? What do I need? What's my reaction that I should take away right now? Uh, yeah, so is this where I get to say eat more beef? Um, yeah. <laughs> what I would say, uh, Andrew, is, uh, and it is a great question, right, in terms of like, okay, what do we do in terms of tangible steps? Now, we're fortunate in Australia in terms of every individual can create their own personalised plan to hit net neutral at an individual or a family unit by 2030. Uh, now, so this is not necessarily about soil, but it is about the whole uh, you know, sort of uh, challenge that we're, we're, we're leaning into is in terms of getting towards a safe, a safe climate. So the more of us that actually put those plans into getting to net neutral by 2030, then uh, the better. And actually, we are so fortunate in Australia because that kind of pathway, it kind of looks like uh, if you haven't got solar, put solar on your roof in the next five years and then put batteries on. Uh, if you haven't got uh, a, uh, uh, and you're looking to buy a new car, Make sure it's a plug-in electric in the next five years At or least. a full electric, right? Now, as soon as you've electrified your house and electrified your transport, you're pretty much 80% of the way there. And then tick the box. Tick the box like uh, always on every purchase, every opportunity to offset because offsets are a market signal to those businesses who are coming up with the new products, new services. And if we collectively don't support that carbon market for its innovation potential, well, then that's a, a, that, that is a, a big, a big disservice. Um, another shout out, uh, if you get the opportunity to go to grow markets, support them. Like every dollar you spend at a grow market, every dollar you spend going straight to a grower, every time you have the opportunity to support that supply chain, that's a vote that sends a market signal that starts to shift that over, overall market. So you cannot underestimate the power of intentional consumerism. Vote every day with your dollars in terms of those, the, you know, those systems, those local systems where we get better, 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 better connected. 
Uh, and then finally, uh, well, another one, uh, consider adding more variety into your diet. Fiber is good. Um, doesn't have to be all vegetarian, but let's eat more wider variety of, 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 of great vegetables. I know my diet's changed since engaging in soil because you recognize for a, a healthy human gut, you need like variety. So it's kind of like, how do you feed? So be kind to your own microbiome, feed it well, feed it, a, uh, feed it often, feed it a wide variety of, of, of food, food substances. Uh, and then if you do have a, a veggie patch in the backyard, you do have grass in the backyard, take your shoes off, uh, you know, try to connect with that underlying soil biome and, you know, go through that mental exercise of, of, of visualizing the amount of life that is there between uh, uh, under your feet, the value of that, uh, of that life, of, uh, of that soil, soil, soil biome and how we can better uh, not protect it, but amplify it, uh, you know, go, go, going forward. Very good. I want to, I want to pick up on one thing you said, which was uh, variety. Ver no, <laughs> no, no. Variety, variety, you know, the, the expression variety is the spice of life. Well, maybe variety is also the key to decarbonization. Yeah. So, uh, Thank well, you so much. Cup, right? Yeah. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, I want to express my gratitudes for the insights that you've shared and the thoughts, thoughtful questions that we've had that some we couldn't get to, but we do appreciate what you uh, you have thought through the, um, the course of the hour. Um, as we continue to explore and implement sustainable business practices in our own lives and in the lives of our, our corporate entities, Let's encourage one another to stay informed and engaged with these particular issues. And a great way, because there's no such thing as a free set of steak knives when it comes to a BCSD Australia webinar, a great way is actually to sign up to the new um, BCSD A ESG snapshot. And you will find the link um, in our, on our website at www.bc. I always get this wrong, www.bcsda.com at bcsda.org.au. I've got that totally wrong, but move on. Just look us up on Google. You'll find it. And on the ESG Snapshot page, you can actually register if you're not a member and you can get that for six weeks for, as a free trial. And we'd love you to come back and talk to us about how you would like to um, receive it further. The recording of this webinar, as patchy as it may have been, um, is going to also be available and we'll be putting it out um, hopefully very soon, certainly by next week. Uh, which we also would like to um, encourage you to return and hear, if you can't, even if you can't see, um, the valuable um, insights that Matthew has given. Uh, for those of you who do want to dive um, deeper or ask further questions, Matthew's email address will be in the thank you follow-up uh, email. I think it goes out late this afternoon or tomorrow. And uh, by all means, reach out to him if you would uh, like to have a further meaningful discussion about change more broadly, because he's always up for it, or in terms of what um, your enterprise might be interested in partnering with AgriProof. So thank you very much for your time and your participation. It was a, very much a privilege to host the conversation. And I, uh, even at my age and stage, is starting to actually get enthusiastic about the impact and the collective action that we're starting to see of the health of our planet, if not the health of one another. So let's continue to work together towards a more sustainable and resilient future. Goodbye for now and take care. Bye. Bye now.